in the beginning. Chapter 1, a Revelation and the Authority of Scripture. Um, first, about the book in the beginning itself, the full title is In the Beginning, Science and Scripture Confirm Creation. And the actual book looks something like this. Um, it's uh, edited by Brian Ball, who also wrote the first chapter. And a little introduction for those of you who don't know Brian Ball. He was born in Devon, England. He got his MA in religion from Andrews University and then a PhD from the University of London. He has been a church pastor, evangelist, conference president, and that is the North England Conference, and then was called to Avondale College where he was the principal. And uh, then he became president of the South Pacific Division. Uh, he is married to Don, and he has th three children. And that's the, uh, uh, the introduction that's given in the book itself. Um, the book is written from a perspective that views scriptures as decisive. And because of that, because its authority takes precedence over all of the sources of information concerning origins, they spend a lot of time with scripture, uh, more than, uh, for example, the book Understanding Creation did. It's uh, mostly about theology. Uh, I'll talk, they will talk about the evidence for the faithful transmission of the text, arguments against higher criticism, and arguments that we should follow Jesus and the New Testament and uh, noting uh, that their belief was uh, firmly in creation. Uh, it does include some scientific chapters by Tim Standish, James uh, Gibson, and R.L. Roth, among others. And uh, of course, R.L. Roth uh, received a copy of it, and that's how I happen to uh, have gotten a copy. Uh, I'll get it back to you later. <laughs> and I'll, I'll probably get my own uh, at, at my earliest opportunity. Uh, it does also, at the end, deal with the uh, sometimes, uh, if we want to call it that compromise, theistic evolution. And it deals with um, the practical ends of evolution, evolutionary morality. Uh, the first sentence kind of defines how Brian Ball understands a, a revelation. He said, revelation may de be defined as a self-disclosure of God to humankind. He goes on to say, any knowledge that human beings may have of God, therefore, is not the result of their own diligent inquiry, but is the outcome of God's gracious initiative and his will to be known. Now, I'm not sure how the second sentence follows from the first, and uh, maybe that's something to come back to later. It, he goes on to say, uh, it is hard to see how Christianity could proceed without appealing to it, referring to Revelation. And I would have to agree with that statement. Um, I am basically summarizing, although sometimes there are short sentences that really do a nice summary themselves. And so um, uh, he states that Christian theology is in crisis, and that's a quote from someone else. Um, and it's a good summary. And now, um, for some of you, you're going, what crisis in theology? It, the only crisis I know of is people who ignore what the Bible says. And I can understand that perspective, and, it's, and from one perspective, it's correct. Uh, but what has happened to conservative, uh, uh, what has happened to uh, Protestant theology is probably worth noting now because what Brian Ball will be talking about is, in fact, um, 
basically trying to combat uh, something that has happened in Protestant theology. Protestant theology started out very conservative. Um, then classical liberal theology came, came up afterwards, which said uh, basically you need to take the Bible and, re and take out all of the miraculous elements. And revelation is miraculous. So um, that's what uh, you should take that out. Um, it avoided miracles. Revelation is a miracle. And so therefore, it tried to get around revelation any way it could. Um, Neo-Orthodox theology started probably with Karl Barth preaching a sermon on Romans. And all of a sudden, he seemed to hit a nerve. Uh, everybody was talking about what he had to say. And he talked as if Romans was, in fact, true. Now, when people tried to pin Karl Barth down, well, does it really mean what you say it means? Is um, Karl Barth was trained as a liberal theologian and realized the weakness of liberal theology, which is basically it doesn't say anything. Um, but also realized the charges liberal theology usually hurled at conservative theology was that it didn't it take the modern world into account, and specifically modern science. And if I can say it that way, basically it learned the lesson from Galileo that we talked about last week that you should not learn. And so Karl Barth never would come out and absolutely say that Romans was, in fact, true. He just acted like it. And defended it on a kind of an existentialist uh, point of view. It came from uh, Soren Kierkegaard and uh, went, through, uh, went through him and, and uh, then mingled into Protestant uh, theology and um, gave all kinds of uh, 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 mixtures of theology that was standard conservative and theology that was uh, um, standard liberal and then kind of you picked and chose whatever you wanted to. Uh, Karl Barth was more on the conservative side. Um, and into that mix came a, um, a Jewish philosopher by the name of Martin Buber who uh, uh, proposed that the, our relationship to others could be uh, viewed as the I, thou, or ich, du in German, as opposed to the I, it relation. Now, there's a lot of discussion, I, thou versus I, you, which was a better translation. Um, you can be seen as plural in English, whereas in, in German, du is, is very much a personal, and it's a one personal relationship. And Martin Buber would propose that uh, God is the ultimate du, the ultimate thou. And uh, in English, of course, thou has archaic and, uh, and uh, worship overtones. Um, whereas uh, du is in German more personal. Uh, Martin Buber, I, I gather from reading uh, some of the comments on him and from reading the English translations that was uh, 
uh, wrote, wrote in a somewhat poetic style, meaning that there's a lot of symbolism involved, there's a lot of, uh, uh, it's not argued in a precise way. Uh, Neo-Orthodox theology tended to view, therefore, revelation as encounter, as pure encounter, as encounter without any propositional truth being given. It was simply the experience. Now, the reason for this is that it immunizes revelation from the criticism that science might otherwise level against it. You see, if you have propositions, then the current scientific consensus might disagree with those propositions and claim that they're false. But if revelation is simply encounter, then the current scientific uh, consensus really doesn't have anything to say about them. It of course makes religion subjective, but the other, the flip side of that coin where you can't criticize it is that in fact it doesn't say anything about physical reality. There's no what they would call propositional content. Yes, you had a comment? Well, I'm just going to raise the question, you know. How, how do you uh, know you're in the right approaching truth or have anything to do with truth if you, uh, are you sure is your encounter correct or is it just imaginary? Well, I, I suspect that the that the final rationale is sort of like what uh, people would do with, uh, with uh, Mormonism sometimes to say that you know in your heart it's right and therefore it's right regardless of whether it fits with current scientific approaches or not. Uh, now of course, okay, so you've got an experience but what does it mean to everyday life? Well, that's the problem, is that this way of doing things does tend to separate theology from everyday life. But those of us who've had some experience in testing truths, especially uh, very firmly held convictions about certain truths, uh, have many experiences of having those turn out to be wrong. Besides, how do you know in an encounter whether you have an encounter with God or the devil who is posing as God? I mean, surely there has to be some content. Otherwise, if we can't distinguish between those two, we've lost the whole point. Well, when, by the time you get to neo-orthodox theology, the theory of the devil is pretty... Um, um, pretty dormant, if not dead. And um, uh, I, I think that that's, that's a weakness of this approach. The other weakness is it doesn't say anything, and that's really important too. In evangelical Protestantism today, there is a strong movement among certain groups of people about uh, who God is and where God is, and they're saying, I need to worship you because God is within you. And so this I thou statement uh, raises the question, were they m tending in that direction of taking God out of his role as creator and the all-powerful being to making God in everything and therefore we worship each other? And then it moves on down to the next part where a revelation as encounter, if, you're, if everything is about an encounter, is it encounters between human beings who view each other as having God within? I don't know 
what Martin Buber would say about that. I do know that Karl Barth would be very uncomfortable with it. Um, and that's one of the problems once you divorce everything from propositional content, uh, that you don't have any way of distinguishing if somebody else puts some other propositional content, how can you say they're wrong? I say this because it's a very common position, number one, in theology. Practical people look at this and say, this is crazy. And I happen to think they're right. But you have to understand, A, that it's a very powerful movement in Protestant theology. B, you have to understand where it comes from, which is they're trying to avoid the 800-pound gorilla in the room. And that is, science is the ultimate arbiter of physical truth, and so we don't want to get any near, anywhere near physical truth. And in order to do that, you have to divorce uh, you have to divorce the Bible from physical truth. And in order to do that, you basically have to say, well, the story is that the Exodus happened. And we're going to go with the story because we like the story. And whether there is evidence that the Exodus actually happened or not, physical evidence, archaeological evidence, that doesn't matter. So it's a way of trying to get around the, the arguments, and it's particularly true with creation. You see, with this, with this view, you can look at creation, you can pull all of these messages out of it, and you can feel good about the theology of creation, but if somebody comes at you with, but it didn't happen, you just say, well, I experienced God there. See, and, 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 and you've, you've neatly undercut their attack. But of course, then it means that you can't say anything to them. It's a way of getting rid of an argument. It's, like I say, it's a response to the 800 pound gorilla in the room. And it's basically by pretending he's not there or to use the other metaphor that's common, the elephant in the room. I think the emphasis on relationship being more important than truth is making it so it doesn't make any difference what you as a scientist may be able to prove because my experience is more important than anything you might say. That's exactly right. And once you understand where these people are coming from and why they're doing what they're doing, it makes a little more sense what they're doing. But, as we shall see, Brian Ball takes issue with this approach. Um, he notes that we can no longer take the traditional uh, idea of re revelation for granted. And the question, of course, immediately is why not? Because as we shall see, the traditional idea is firmly grounded in scripture. And the reason why not is because of the elephant in the room that nobody wants to deal with. And so everybody pretends is not there. He asks these questions, what is revelation? Can it be understood? Now, of course, that's a theoretical question. Uh, the next one is a practical question. Has it occurred? Does the Bible itself have anything to say on the matter? Is the Bible the result of divine revelation? If it is, then what is an appropriate response? Not the least are questions relating to revelation and reason, whether or not revelation occurs in propositional form, and if God's self-revelation is just that, a disclosure of himself and not also of information about him. Now, the reason I gave you that background is because if you're looking at this and you're going, what is he talking about? Questions relating to revelation and reason. Of course, revelation interacts with reason. You're going to go, 
And um, whether or not revelation occurs in propositional form, of course revelation occurs in propositional form. Um, if you don't understand what he is fighting against, it just blows right over your head. Revelation, historically understood, basically he's going to go through what I just did, um, and interestingly, I did it before I read him. Um, uh, I, I've seen this before. Uh, the early church, and God revealed himself in scripture and in Jesus, and it has a very high view of scripture. The scripture cannot be broken. to quote Jesus. And of course, the scripture, it takes Jesus' words at pretty much face value. And that's why in the traditional church sermon, people will look at the tenses of the Greek verbs because to them it matters, because this is what the story actually was. And they're trying to understand the story as carefully as possible so that they can understand what happened what import it has for us, because we're going to take it more or less and block. The medieval church started to allow tradition to be part of the story. And tradition, in fact, sometimes would even trump scripture. Although they wouldn't say it that way. What they would say is scripture has to be understood in consonance with tradition. So they would actually say they have a high view of scripture, but in point of fact, if, if a clear meaning of scripture went against tradition, they would take tradition instead. Um, that's the, the single most obvious example is the changing of the day of worship from Saturday to Sunday. Tradition trumped scripture it did so by being able to reinterpret so that all of the passages that referred to, to Sabbath, Saturday, were transferred to Sunday. The Reformation came back and said, no, that's not right. Scripture is by far superior to tradition. And uh, maybe tradition has some minor subsidiary role, but it certainly does not have the authority that scripture does. And one of the principles that he emphasizes is the sufficiency of scripture. That is, scripture is good enough all by itself and doesn't need additions uh, for the purposes of salvation. Now, in order to make that work, you also have to have the perspicuity of Scripture. That is, Scripture can actually be understood by you and I. We don't have to go to a priest to figure it out because, you see, as soon as you do that, then you're right back into tradition because the priest tells you what it really means. And that's one of the reasons for the priesthood of all believers, but that's not part of what he has to say. I'm, that's my own addition in that particular area. Uh, the Enlightenment came along and it rejected what it called the tyranny of Scripture. And it raised all kinds of intellectual objections to Scripture. Um, it's a matter of argument as to whether they were simply objections to begin with or whether they were objections because the Enlightenment didn't want Scripture to have um, sway over people's uh, belief systems and their lives. But the Enlightenment was very big on, we can figure this out on our own. And of course, you see, Scripture tells us all kinds of things that we wouldn't otherwise know, that we couldn't figure out on our own. And that means that we have to listen to somebody else. That means that there's some other authority out there that uh, 
that we can't just approach this as a blank slate. And so the traditional view of scripture was uh, at loggerheads with the Enlightenment. Um, question. The Enlightenment. During trusted. this a Enlightenment period, how did people come to this idea that we can figure everything out on our own? Because that automatically assumes that reality is a closed system, which we are part of. But if reality is an open system, then by definition you cannot figure everything out because you don't have access to everything. Well, the Enlightenment was big on human reason and got to the point where it, if you could, if you want to put it that way, deified it. And you can only have one God. And if your God is human reason, then you're then uh, then a God who claims to be above human reason and uh, is is simply not tenable. W the statement that we can figure everything out for ourselves actually came from some pretty obvious things. We figured out for ourselves how the universe went. We started looking at stars, and we could say that, for example, Saturn went around the sun instead of the Earth. That bodies that were not acted upon by a particular force kept moving in the same direction relative to whatever observer there was. Um, that it's only, it's only, it's only the force that stops them. But, but, we oh. figured out a whole bunch of things but, uh, and then it went from there to well we can figure out everything and I think like many uh, many philosophical uh, simplifications it's an oversimplification. Uh, it, it really represents an extrapolation and as all extrapolations uh, it, it, it really runs afoul very easily because we are rather limited. And how do we extrapolate ourselves into everything? Well, it, it's true. Um, but there weren't people that had the courage to stand up and, or I shouldn't say that. There were some who had the courage to stand up and say, stop, this is not fair. But for most people, science just kept getting better and better and better. And for us, in the modern age, science still, in a certain sense, it appears to be doing better. I mean, we put people on the moon. We can, at least in some instances, cure cancer. Um, people look to science for all the answers. And as long as you're doing that, then theology has to trim its sails to fit science. And that's why I said last week that there is one lesson we should not learn from Galileo that many people desperately want us to learn. And that's why Galileo keeps coming up and up and up again and again and again. Now, um, Brian Ball says, quote, history has actually, yeah, well, that's, that's hit only himself. History has repeatedly demonstrated the persistent attraction of this viewpoint and its devastating consequences for the individual and, and for society. I wish he had uh, fleshed that out a little bit more. It, it reminds me of what the Bible said, that the man who trusts in his own heart is a fool. Paul, uh, you might uh, flesh that out. Uh, there is a school of thought that the French Revolution was the fleshing out of uh, the Enlightenment, and we know what ended, what, what that resulted in. You know, the reign of terror and the bloodbath and so on. Uh, I'm not sure the connection is as solid as some would like to think, but it's it's certainly a, 
uh, enlightenment certainly may have contributed to that uh, total loss of any firm foundation for anything, and it resulted in anarchy. Well, I think that it's arguable uh, that, that that is correct. Uh, unfortunately, Ball doesn't specifically mention the French Revolution. Um, it would be, it'd be nice if he expanded on that a little bit, although maybe when we get to the ch uh, chapter on, uh, on uh, evolutionary ethics, we'll find out um, what he has in mind. Um, The, uh, the contemporary scene is actually eclectic. It takes from various places. Uh, it doesn't like full-blown enlightenment. It doesn't like full-blown conservative theology. And, and uh, Bart is just one particular way of pulling um, uh, some pieces from each one, tending to lean towards the conservative position. Um, there are a number of other people, uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, who perhaps took more equally from both sides. Um, uh, oh, Paul Tillich probably leaned way over towards the liberal side in that particular aspect, but still wanted some pieces of conservatism in there. Um, Langdon Gilkey is a Paul Tillich uh, protege, as I understand, and of course Fritz Guy is a Langen Gilkey protege. So uh, you can see where this kind of thing eventually comes back to us as Adventists as well as for the rest of uh, Protestantism. Um, but the, there is still the continuing influence of Enlightenment thinking, and uh, there are a lot of people uh, who by the idea that the books of Moses were in fact not written by Moses, but were written in several stages. Um, the documentary hypothesis, which itself has undergone several different uh, 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 revisions. Uh, the New Testament has been radically reinterpreted. This is where you get the Jesus movement. Um, and. Uh, uh, Revelation has been, in a particular way, redefined. It's not words about God, but it's an encounter with God which is ineffable. Is basically, you can't contain it in words. Uh, you can't even approximate it in words. And again, you, it sounds kind of crazy until you realize where they're coming from. And then it makes a lot more sense. The biblical witness to Revelation um, uh, Brian Ball takes issue with the claim that the Bible has relatively little to say about Revelation. And he says, oh yes it does. The, uh, in Deuteronomy 29, 29 uh, it says the secret things belong to the Lord our God, implying that there are some things that are just above us. And I suspect that for the ancient Hebrews there were a lot of things that were above them that, uh, that are not above us now, although we still have the same problem. We don't understand how, for example, a quantum can be a particle and a wave at the same time. And... Uh, <laughs> Interestingly, one of the solutions to both that and the idea that um, uh, that uh, quantum mechanics needs to fit with uh, general relativity is to quantize the universe entirely, in which case we are basically in a uh, mathematical simulation, if you want to put it that way. Uh, that that what we have are not particles that interact with each other, but rather uh, we are in a universe designed by a mathematician and run by mathematical and not mechanical rules. And um, 
uh, Brian Ball mentions uh, Sam, uh, Samuel as getting revelation specifically. David, who got a revelation that uh, his house would live forever, uh, apparently at least partly through uh, prophet Nathan, but uh, partly on his own. Nebuchadnezzar, who uh, got a revelation and then got the interpretation of that revelation from uh, Daniel. And of course, Daniel further. And Amos, who says, surely the Lord God will do nothing except he reveals his secrets to the servants, the prophet. That sounds a lot like propositional revelation. Uh, revelation throughout the Old Testament involving words, thus saith the Lord. And then the prophet will go on to say what the Lord says. And that includes Genesis 1, where God speaks and it happens. So that words seem to be involved in a number of places in the Old Testament. And of course, words not just meaning words, but in the meaning of logos, not just the word, but the concept behind the word. Writing those words down did not nullify the revelation. It may perhaps put a little distance between us and the revelation, but it, there's still revelation there to be had. Um, the New Testament uh, refers to apocalypsis and apocalypto. Um, I reveal uh, revelation, uh, the, the, the title to uh, one of the books, in the, the last book in the New Testament is in fact Apocalypsis, Revelation. It is revealing, it is unveiling, apo, away, calypsis, the veil. Um, so it's something that's already true, but it's hidden from us as humans, and it uses words to do that unveiling. Uh, Jesus' words were noted to possess authority. He talked with one like, uh, like one with authority, not as the scribes. And Paul, in his epistle to Galatians, said, For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation, apocalypsis, of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ pulled back the veil and allowed me to see what's really going on. And it wasn't something that Peter taught me or James taught me or, or Andrew or anybody else. And it can't be put off to the parousia of Christ. And at this point, if you don't understand the background, you're going, what's he talking about? Well, one of the things in theology that has been done is to turn the parousia, that is, the appearing of, or the, to be literally, it's a standing beside. But it's used in the term of when Jesus comes the second time. But what's happened is that in a lot of Protestant literature, that has turned into, this is the Jesus who stands beside you when you have this mystical experience. And so what, what Brian Ball is saying is, you can't take all of these revelations and put them off into a kind of a personal encounter with God that God is revealing not just the fact that he exists and, and the ability to interact with him, but also there is some head content to this as well as heart content. Revelation, according to Brian Paul, is much more than simply encounter. That is, there is actual factual content to Revelation. Now, 
there are two kinds of general uh, revelation. One of them is general revelation that comes to everybody. In Romans um, 120 talks about how people have no excuse because what's God's eternal power and majesty is evident in the things that have been created. So they are without excuse. Ball's comment is, um, such revelation, however, has generally been held to be limited, perhaps awakening the conscience, an awareness of God, and a desire to know more of him, but inadequate for a full understanding of either God or humanity, and hence for salvation. Now, I'm a little uncomfortable with that, and maybe we'll come back to that later. There is special re revelation, which consists of the man Jesus and what he did and what, how he acted and what he said, but also the scripture, which came before him and predicted his coming, and the scripture that came after him and recorded what happened when he came. Because after all, none of us were there, uh, in this room anyway, and none of us can actually witness what Jesus did. And so we're dependent upon the witnesses that were in fact there or that recorded uh, what had been done. Special revelation is needed not just for human alienation, but human finitude. And this is important. Um, and special revelation, of course, you see, is propositional in a sense. Um, it was given, for example, in Eden. Uh, and this was verbal communication. God talked with Adam and Eve in the garden before sin came. So that it's not just fallen people who can't understand enough about God. It's not just our wickedness. It's a simple fact that we are finite and don't know everything. And God lets us know things that we wouldn't otherwise know. God also revealed himself through mighty acts. But if, if, you, the, the, if you don't have an account of those acts, then they only exist for the people who actually saw them. And the kids don't know anything, or especially the grandkids. Otherwise, what God wanted to communicate through his mighty acts would be lost to subsequent generations. A particularity is part of revelation. It is not enough to simply say, well, God says I am love as a kind of a general thing. There's also the fact that Jesus was here at a particular time and came in particularly died, and he's not dying every new generation. That idea that there is some particularity is anathema to the Enlightenment. And that's one of the reasons why the Enlightenment fought so hard against Scripture. It, according to Ball, it's an extension of the scandal of the cross, and I would have to agree why should one man's dying make a difference for every single person in the universe? Uh, Jesus was, in fact, not just a martyr. He was a sacrifice. And there's a difference. Jesus' cross needed divine explanation for us to understand it. The Bible is in fact unique. It cannot be treated just like any other piece of literature. Now, I would maintain that what the Enlightenment has done with the Bible is treated it worse than most other forms of literature, rather than just like any other piece of literature. The Bible has some claims that God spoke you have to take that into account if you're going to properly understand the Bible. Special revelation as rational proposition 
what Paul is trying to say here is that uh, revelation involves words, concepts, ideas that could, in fact, theoretically be false and are, in fact, not. Revelation needs reason because an encounter is not enough for the reasons that uh, Anita has already outlined. Isaiah 118 asks us, come, let us reason together, let us think about this together, uh, let us discuss it with words. Special revelation does lead to a personal encounter, and th this is to say that the idea that encounter is, is, is a wrong way to look at this is not quite correct. It's not wrong so much as it's incomplete that Joseph Scriven, who wrote What a Friend We Have in Jesus, which is his personal encounter, all our sins and griefs to bear, what a privilege to carry everything to the Lord in prayer. Um, he wrote under the preaching of the Second Great Awakening, which was, interestingly enough, factually based. The words, in fact, do have factual content. That the, that the attempt to have the encounter as something ineffable will not, in the final ana analysis, work. They can, in fact, explain historical events. And the example that uh, Ball gives is Jesus. Jesus died on the cross. There were very few people who, maybe the um, centurion, who said, truly, this was the Son of God. But even there, you don't have somebody looking at it, just seeing what happened, and saying how much God loves us. That that was something that came afterwards with the understanding of the event in its context. And in fact, part of the context for the cross is the resurrection. Christianity would not have survived without propositional revelation because again, you, the encounter, if there are no propositions attached to it, cannot be transmitted from one person to another. It dies with the people who had the encounter. Encounter without propositions that can be expressed in words is shallow, according to uh, Dr. Ball. And this gets back now to what are we going to do about it, revelation and authority. He asked the question, should scripture be regarded as authoritative, that is to say, authoritative in the areas it specifically addresses? And I think I take it from this that he would learn the lesson that Galileo should teach us, and that is that you don't take everything that might possibly be pulled out of Scripture, or even everything that people might have thought about Scripture at the time that they were writing, and use that as an authority. Because that lost big time. But that, when scripture intends to teach something specific, that it is authoritative in that regard. And the short answer that he gives is yes. And his support for that <coughs> is interestingly enough to cite a couple of catechisms, a Westminster and um, I think the Lutheran Catechism. Um, he says, if the Bible records revelations, then it automatically has authority. And I think most of us would understand that. If you have something that is giving you information, then you have to listen to it. Um, 
If somebody says, my opinion is that the moon is made out of green cheese, you shrug your shoulders and move on. If somebody says, I've studied the spectroscopy of the moon, and, uh, and here it is, and the moon is in fact uh, not made out of green cheese, it's made out of rock. Probably better pay attention to that, and you better pay even more attention to somebody who says, I've been to the moon, and here's a moon rock. Especially if people have seen him leave Earth and attract him, and uh, there's been constant uh, video communication in between. Now, the modern age thinks it has little use for authority. This is one place where I, I think that he's wrong. What's happened is the modern age has transferred authority to someplace else, not that it ha doesn't have authority. And uh, <coughs> some of the transfer is, in fact, not valid. Authority does go against human autonomy. Uh, in science, though, we have authorities. Um, it's just that, in theory at least, their authority is supposed to be based upon experience, experiment, and so forth. The attack on Western civilization that he sees happening, and um, he's not alone in that, uh, is in part an attack on the biblical authority that is the root of Western civilization. And I think that's probably perfectly fair to say um, that in some sense, uh, let's say Marxism is an attack on biblical authority. Um, he quotes Harry Blameyers as saying, quote, uh, well, actually quoting him, contemporary secularism and then he launches into the quote from Blameyers, heavily biased as it is towards individualism, subjectivism, and atomic intellectualism is quickly eroding what remains of the Christian mind, oriented towards a truth revealed, demanding, and divinely guaranteed, whose objective certitude and authoritativeness are alike distasteful to a secularism deeply committed to self-culture as opposed to self-discipline and to a destiny of mastery as opposed to rigorous service. Um, as Harry Blameyer says again, it is either the bowed head or the turned back. You either believe it or you don't. Biblical authority, and I think this is the, near the end of the, the chapter, was threatened not only from without, but also from within by those who, quote, really do not subject, subject themselves to this authority and do not manifest the reality of their confession in their daily lives. So his, his uh, final comment, um, is that um, while we may think that all these other people are doing bad things and uh, uh, are proposing bad ideas, that if we don't live the belief system that we do have, that we are undermining that belief system just as surely as anybody who's arguing strongly against it. Now, my, my own view of, of, of what's, uh, what he had to say, I have a couple of questions. Uh, number one, is he right? Um, I think mostly yes. I am a little troubled by the apparent insistence that special revolution is necessary for salvation. It seems to leave a lot of people out of the possibility of salvation. And um, it is perhaps obvious that 
some who will in most accounts be saved had only limited knowledge of God's self-revelation in Jesus. A Abraham didn't know Jesus personally, had never seen him. Well, he saw his day maybe, but that's not, a, not the same thing as seeing the, the person of Jesus. And there are some who in the New Testament were known, knew only of John's baptism, and the question will come up, are they saved? I'm uncomfortable with the, uh, the idea that uh, uh, special revelation and, and therefore jumping immediately to Jesus is necessary for salvation. I think that God has enlightened people everywhere. Um, but I uh, could stand to be corrected on that. I, I would really like to have uh, Brian Ball here for dialogue, but unfortunately he's not here. Uh, the next question that I'll ask is, is he effective? Does this make a good case for someone sitting on the fence to believe in the authority of Scripture? Um, is it useful for rallying the faithful? Um, uh, those are the two things that I, th that I think that probably effectiveness would be measured by. And I would say that it is a good summary of biblical teaching, and it is a good summary of the history of thought on Revelation, including the Enlightenment thought and, um, and uh, liberal theology, which came directly from the Enlightenment, and then the uh, various forms of uh, neo-orthodoxy that have tried to, to mesh the two. And with that, I will uh, uh, leave the floor open for comments and questions. Uh, yes. When I was much younger, faced with the mysteries of Revelation, I decided to study the matter for myself. I felt that I had help in the spirit of prophecy. Ellen White would make clear some of the things that I could not make clear myself. But I found out that she says very little about Revelation, particularly. But one quote that I remember, she said, now, don't be too dogmatic about things that are yet to come, lest you be embarrassed, you and, and the church. But I have a book now that I wrote, a commentary on Daniel and Revelation. I'm no longer, I'm no wiser now than I was then until this morning. Yesterday, I got the latest edition of Adventist Today. And an article in there says that the horrific things of Revelation are similar, if not the same, as the horrific nightmares that we have ourselves. Therefore, the prophet on the island of Patmos probably had a psychic delusion, therefore, Revelation. A nightmare. <laughs> As, um, are, are mushrooms the, uh, the way to go for uh, enlightenment then? You know, um, as I was growing up, we were told as kids, buy but do not sell, listen, do not speak. You should be seen and not heard, that sort of thing. So consequently, when frequently, you know, there were gatherings of the elders, my brother and I would kind of pretend to be busy with other things, but we would listen with all ears to see what the stories that are going around. You know what I'm saying? There's a saying for that, little pictures have big ears. <laughs> yes. The thing about this sort of thing is, you know, I have often heard people talk about so-and-so who all his life was exemplary and then something happened and they did something and then the others chimed in and said, 
Ah, now we know what he or she is really all about. And this puzzled me a great deal. Because we as kids would get into mischief on a regular occasion. Not once in 20 years. Hmm. You know, and, and yet we never thought of one another as being measured by the failings. As often and as frequent as they were. You, you know what I'm trying to say? So the thing that strikes me is that we somehow, when we see something go wrong, we somehow just love to extrapolate that into representing the whole character of the person who committed the egregious wrong, whether deliberately or incidentally or however accidentally. And why do we make that kind of a conclusion? We seem to somehow discount goodness, virtue, anything of meaning as being of lesser value or at least as being indicators of our own naivety to even believe in it. But when somebody does something wrong, something however nefarious or even distantly relatable to something wrong, then we feel a sudden stroke of insight. Now we understand. Do you, do you get what I'm driving at here? What is it in us that gives us this inherent bias to believe the wrong much more than to believe something good and something nice and something lovely and something beautiful. This is the thing that strikes me from this kind of, why would anybody even think that this was something worth writing an article about? I had a nightmare and it occurred to me, ha! Ah, Probably John had a nightmare too, hence revelation. And Daniel, well, yeah, he was worried. Many nightmares. When I'm worried, I have nightmares. Guess about what I have nightmares about. I have nightmares about the church. I have nightmares. I had nightmares about La Sierra. But I didn't blame it on God. And I didn't blame it on Paul Geem. Or revelations or anybody else. I just understood it to reflect the state of mind I've been in as I've been wringing my hands wondering what's going on and dear Lord please help us out of our own misery that we're in here. And realizing that goodness and beauty and love and kindness and truth, and that means substantive truth, not just some uh, ephemeral encounter somewhere is what we desperately need to get us out of this kind of mess, which we desperately seem to be, hmm, how should I say, which we are insisting on jumping into and thinking ourselves how clever we are in doing so. This is the kind of nightmares that I worry about. And so when, when people with their <laughs> ever so clever brains come up with these kinds of papers and explanations, I, I pray, dear Lord, help us, because we're so bright, bright enough to be a problem, but not bright enough to be a solution. Give us grace and wisdom to know the difference between those two, lest we just insistently jump into the fire, thinking how bright it is. Is this where wisdom is? Or have we ever actually felt the presence of God in our lives that illuminates the mind and insight into the nature of things? 
so that the eyes become opened instead of firmly shut. Excuse me. Your problem is you've never been through a labyrinth. Well, here, here's the thing about that kind of an article, and it's, and it's important. Um, you know, at, at first glance, uh, a believer is likely to say, that's crazy, why would anybody want to believe? Uh, but the reason is because science has proved that there is no outside there that can communicate with us, that we live in a closed system. <coughs> and whether there's a God or not is debatable, but whether there's a God that can interfere with what's going on here is without question false. Once you take that position, then revelation has to be explained by some kind of natural phenomenon. And um, why not nightmares instead of something else? It's as good a fit as any. Of course, in Daniel's case, you keep seeing these four things keep coming back. And they're identified with specific nations, uh, some of which have not gotten significant power at all. Um, the king of Grecia is the goat. Okay, that pretty well nails that one. The ram is Medo-Persia. Uh, look at it from Daniel's point of view. Uh, the king of Grisha hasn't done anything to merit that kind of confidence. And so if you take Daniel straightforwardly, you start saying, you know, this is not easily made into... Uh, a nightmare. And so for Daniel, you can't say it's a nightmare. What you have to say is Daniel was living at a much later time in history when Greeks did make sense because it had already overrun the world. And Rome did make sense because it was threatening Greece from the West. <coughs> and um, that uh, well maybe, maybe not Rome, maybe actually Antiochus Epiphanes is the fourth person because this is the biggest thing in the writer's mind. But that's why Daniel has to be put at the time of the Maccabees. It can't be put later than the time of the Maccabees because references to the book of Daniel have popped up in that era. And in fact, uh, there's a manuscript of Daniel that by the conventional dating, um, is within 50 years or less of that period. And it's of Daniel 10 and 11, which is the worst case scenario. So nobody puts it beyond the Maccabees. But that's why the Maccabean mm -hmm. theory comes up. Mm -hmm. And when you realize that it's all in response to the elephant in the room, which is science is so good and it just keeps advancing, and if religion ever steps out of line, science is going to squash it. So religion should, should carefully keep in places where the elephant can't step on it. That was about Revelation, wasn't it? The book of Revelation. Yeah. But you see, oh. Revelation and Daniel are very similar types of books with very similar kinds of visions of stuff. And if oh. you're going to go for Revelation as a, as a mushroom-induced... Uh, or perhaps bad pizza induced um, a nightmare, then the same thing is true <coughs> for Daniel. Because it has the same kinds of qualities. Uh, Paul? Yeah. Uh, uh, <coughs> I'm going along that line a little further. Belief in the Bible is not something that's irrational. Uh, there are very good reasons to believe in the Bible. Geographically, it's authenticated to a certain extent. Uh, historically, uh, it's a good authentication. And then we have uh, what you were touching on a little bit, the revelation which uh, fulfilled prophecy 
that uh, some are very hard to explain. I mean, all the prophecies about Christ and, and of course, uh, the uh, 2300 days and so on that Isaac Newton believed in and Uriah Smith and so on. Uh, too many coincidences there for you to just throw it out. Uh, I think uh, the chapter might have uh, enjoyed a little, little uh, additional comment about that factor that uh, it's uh, our, our belief in, in the Bible is there's good reason to believe in the Bible and you have to explain an awful lot of things if you're not going to go that route uh, so that uh, <clears throat> rationally you can say, hey, uh, show me, show me something better. Um, and the other thing is that I think it's important to realize that the universe shows evidence of not being a closed system. That nobody can take the universe as it is, as a closed system, and explain, for example, where life came from. Um, now, I'm not saying that in some future time we might not be able to figure out uh, where life came from, uh, that, that I can close that off theoretically, but I can say that for right now the evidence is so strongly against it as to make it for practical purposes unbelievable. Now, once you do that, then there is a God, then he does have at least the possibility of saying things that are worth our while. Then when you come into coincidences such as the correspondence of uh, the stories in the book of Daniel with history afterwards, you start saying maybe there is a God who reveals secrets. As the book of Daniel flat out claims. Uh, and it gets even more sticky when you look at that manuscript of Daniel and you find out that they had to twist the criteria for dating the book of Daniel by paleography in order to get it below where uh, 160 4 BC, where uh, Daniel is supposed to have been written by the conventional, well, the now conventional theory. Um, if you have, uh, if you have a manuscript of Daniel that's older than the Maccabean theory, and it's of Daniel 10 and 11, which is the, is the precise point where you have to move things down that low, uh, then all of a sudden the theory that Daniel was written at the time it claimed to be by the person it claimed to be written by becomes a much more attractive theory. And if you find out that there was in fact uh, somebody other than Belshazzar himself who went by the name of Belshazzar. Belteshazzar is actually just a perversion of Belshazzar. And that there was a servant of Nebu and uh, somebody by the name of Hanan, as in Hananiah, and somebody by the name of Mishula Marduk, which could easily be perverted into Meshach, that attended a specific gathering early on in Nebuchadnezzar's reign, you begin to say, whoever wrote the book of Daniel knew a whole lot more than anybody in the second century BC ought to have known. And maybe it was actually written in the fifth century. And once you go there, then you have to deal with the fact that there is clear prophecy. And once you go there, you have to say, maybe we need to listen to all of the biblical record with an ear towards hearing what a God has revealed to various people. And that puts us in a whole different way of looking at things. 
Now, that's one of the reasons why I'm a little uncomfortable with the approach that's being made because it takes the biblical record, and I think you can make a good case for the Bible itself, believing in its own inspiration. But the question that comes up then is how do you validate it? Whereas if you invalidate of the standard critique of Revelation and you validate some parts of Revelation by history, then I think you can make a much better case for somebody who's sitting on the fence and not really knowing whether they want to believe this stuff or not to say, maybe I should believe it. Um, I just started uh, reading through the book of Ezekiel. And I'm in about 15 pages, so there's a lot more to go. You know, having over 40 chapters. And three times already I've read where he mentions Noah, Daniel, and Job. And I don't know how many more times this will come up. Um, he's also constantly talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. God has said, I, you know, I've made up my mind, I'm going to destroy it and scatter the people. Well, I'm taking that as referring to the destruction of uh, Jerusalem, the, the first uh, uh, destruction. So I'm assuming he's a, I um, uh, can't think of the right word not popping out of my brain right at this moment, but he lived the same time as Jeremiah. Now, maybe he's talking about the one after Christ, but I don't think so. And yet he's already referred to these three individuals. So um, it seems to me like that pretty well sets the, the time when uh, both Ezekiel and Daniel would have been written. Uh, apparently Jerusalem hasn't been destroyed for the last time. But if he talks about Daniel, then um, Jerusalem must have been uh, overtaken. He's already served some time in, in uh, maybe it's just the beginning of Daniel's career. But uh, he, he's apparently well known um, as far as Ezekiel is concerned. So that seems like that tells us something. It does tell us something, and um, in fact, it's interesting that uh, Noah, Daniel, and Job appear there. Uh, Daniel appears more often than the other two because there's a point that, that uh, uh, Ezekiel is claiming inspiration and is speaking for God and says, are you wiser than Daniel? And of course, question is, what Daniel is he talking about if he's not talking about the Daniel that's listed in? Uh, uh, the spelling is a little bit different, although the spelling has not been hardened at that point. Um, but th that's, that's a problem for the standard theory. Now, what they've done is they've said, well, but there is a Daniel. And that Daniel is an Ugaritic Daniel. And that Daniel has to do with um, uh, an ancient legend. The problem with that Daniel, of course, is that he's not particularly all that wise. And he's not particularly, well, he's maybe that righteous, but certainly not that wise. And uh, so, Dan, the Daniel of Scripture still fits better. But you see, if you know that Daniel didn't really exist, uh, the biblical Daniel, then you have to blame it on this other Daniel. Then you have to say, uh, well, uh, Ezekiel was talking about the first destruction of Jerusalem, which was in, uh, what, 586 or so B.C.? I'd have to look it up exactly. Um, the destruction by uh, Nebuchadnezzar at the time of Zedekiah. It seems to me like a stretching uh, uh, exaggeration to the extreme. 
It isn't if you know that that's the way things go. It is if you don't know, and that's the key. If you know that the, that the universe is a closed system, then you have no choice but to fit it into certain ways. Well, they, could, they can make that argument about Noah if you don't believe in the flood. Yes. On, you can make all sorts of excuses. Yeah, you can make all kinds of excuses. Uh, but this is the key. This is the key. That what you need is that extra information that the universe is a closed system. Once you do that, then you can make all kinds of things fit. And what's happened is that we have taken the results of academics who started out that way, believing that the universe was a closed system. And then, and then, and then we have tried to fit our faith around it. Well, those things are deliberately designed to destroy our faith. So it's not going to work very well. And I think we should quit trying. Uh, you mentioned uh, even if at some point we were to discover how life could originate, I would venture to suggest that we could more easily arrive to the conclusion how life cannot originate. Because at present, we have a great deal of faith in random chance and natural selection. This harkens to the analogous situation when computers, well, how should I say, automatic calculating machines were first invented, and then computers. The common belief spread among mathematicians that very soon we will have computers work out all the mathematical theories and the mathematicians will simply be out of work. What has actually transpired? We now have more mathematicians than ever before and we have increase in both the power and capacity and capability of computers and increase in the number of mathematicians. Well, maybe computers came first and man came second. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but how could this be the case if computers could work out all the mathematical theorems? Well, it so happens that about uh, shortly after computers were first invented, along came a mathematician who did a rigorous study of mathematical theorems and came to a fascinating conclusion that was published, which gave new life to mathematicians. And the conclusion was this. Each mathematical theorem requires at least one new assumption. And how is a computer going to make an assumption that would be interesting to us? This was the crux of the problem. When, until we realized this very critical point, we thought computers are going to work out all the math, we will have no math to worry about. It'll all be worked out. Uh, the whole universe and everything. And now suddenly we realize, oops, there is a limit to what computers can accomplish, regardless of how powerful, regardless of how versatile, and whatever else we do with them. So now, I would like to make a proposition. I would like to make the proposition, which is as follows, that life itself cannot originate by itself any more than a computer can originate by itself. Computer being simpler than life. And the reason why is because random chance is not sufficient. You know, when people apply to various positions, there is this frequently, to many advertised openings, there is this statement that goes along there that says, 
prior experience required? If every job required prior experience, then there would be no new workers. It's True. that simple. True. But this is the proposition. What if, in order to assemble something into a living thing, living entity, there is a pro requirement in the job description that says, prior experience required. This is a very simple, very simple little requirement. What on earth do you do with that? How do you propose that it's going to happen by random? So what, does the me what is the meaning of prior experience required? What is assumed in that? What the assumption is that that person has a lot of information, practical information, that is not present in the job itself. The job cannot do itself. It requires somebody with extraneous information, outside information, which is needed in order to, to carry out that task appropriately. New and improved. You are actually adding, adding value to what it is that you are working on. The, the assembly doesn't direct itself and you just provide the muscle. That's not enough. You need to actually have the skill set required to accomplish that task. Well, All right. It, it's even more than that. Um, uh, there, there are two things where uh, one in mathematics there is um, Godel's theorem which is to say that for any system that is complex enough to include the numbers which is to say for any mathematical theorem that's worth its uh, salt <laughs> that the numbers that's very that basic actually. <laughs> that's pretty basic uh, <laughs> that there is always at least one theorem that is true and that is known to be true but that cannot be proved. Wow. And, and so uh, what it says is mathematics is not a closed system. If the the next thing that's interesting is that there is a problem in computers that has been proved not to be soluble regardless of how complex the computer is and that is a computer cannot determine by looking at the code for every program whether it will eventually stop whether it will stop. or whether it, will, whether it will keep on going Enough. infinitely yes. and uh, it's called the halting problem and it's known not to be soluble by computers. So computers are simply not equipped to handle everything. I would make the proposition that humans are not equipped to handle everything. Absolutely. And I would make the proposition that the assumption that they are is a, if I can put it that way, a prideful assumption. And that, that uh, the enlightenment in a certain sense is an exercise in human pride. Like in, kiting. In pride in human accomplishment and human uh, intellect, which is not warranted by the facts. And once you get out of that, then the en en Enlightenment critique collapses and you can start asking questions about the Bible being authoritative again and the Enlightenment can't stop you. And that's why I said there are certain lessons that we should not learn from Galileo. And one of them is that religion always loses and that science always wins. Uh, philosophically, you can make room for yourself. Beyond that, practically, you can make room for yourself. And I'm a good example of that. Um, I went to look at 
carbon-14 dating. And I made some proposals based on conservative theological theory and certain minor assumptions about radiometric decay. And having done that, we found that, in fact, nature conformed to those assumptions in at least two areas. One, on whether there was carbon-14 in very old material, and one, on whether um, uh, artifacts from Assyria, um, the historical age matched the carbon-14 age. And in fact, they don't, and they deviate in the direction in which I predicted. So this stuff works. It simply is not true that if you go on, quote, religious, end quote, assumptions, that somehow you're doomed, whereas if you stick with, quote, science, end quote, uh, you're more likely to find the truth. That's a really important point. And once we get that, then this whole discussion, I think, falls apart. There is no need to argue that revelation is only an experience that is ineffable, not reducible, or at least not partially reducible to words to propositions, to ideas, to content. That it is not just simply an emotional reaction with no uh, intellectual content whatsoever. But the reason they're arguing that is because they're afraid of the gorilla, the elephant in the room. The fact of the matter is the elephant is dead. <laughs> this is the thing that, while I'm on a rant, really bothers me and have nightmares about. How is it that our theologians keep being afraid of science? If they really wanted science so much, why didn't they go do science? In, then you would actually learn something about it. This way, they think they're curtsying to the authority of science while knowing nothing about it. I, I think it's arguable that at least a substantial minority, if not a majority, of our ministers should have some science courses so they have some clue as to what they're dealing with. I think it makes for a stronger theologian. And with that, I think I'll um, quit and we'll come back next week and we'll discuss chapter two, which is, has to do with the transmission of the Bible. And again, for, those, for believers, it's not a big deal. Well, of course, the Bible is transmitted well. But what you have to understand is that there was an argument against that.